Yeah, I was given the impossible task of summarizing all the complexities of taxonomic names and such in 15 to 20 minutes. Um, I'm going to do the best I can. Um, I, I, my experience in Tadwig is there's generally two clusters of attendees. Some of them are, are biology nerds who know a little thing or two about computers, and the others are computer nerds who know a little thing or two about biology. Um, so I think I'm going to try to attack both of those sides. So, um, you know, some of you will find half the talk boring, and some of you will find the other half of the talk boring, and the ones who know both sides are going to find the whole thing complete rubbish. <laughs> um, but one other technical point, it is actually still 19 October in Hawaii, which is where I come from, so I think I'm covered on that front. All right, where do I point this? All right, so when I was in graduate school, we, um, my co graduate student cohorts and I used to have definitions for each other's field of expertise. So physiology was the study of dying animals, and behavior was the study of terrified animals, and <laughs> my favorite was ecology, which was the laborious task of proving the obvious. Um, but it, it, I was the only taxonomist, and, and they took great pleasure in referring to my field as the perpetual reclassification of misnamed species, with the emphasis on perpetual job security and all that. Um, and then my best friend in grad school, Randy Kosaki, I think put it most correctly and most bluntly, which is as a necessary evil. Um, and everyone always focuses on the evil part about it, but even Randy was willing to concede the middle word here, necessary. And I think that's true. I mean, a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around all the pedantry associated with, with taxonomic nomenclature and all of that, but it is fundamentally necessary, not just for biology, but particularly for biodiversity informatics. So I guess the purpose of my talk is to give a sort of overview of some of the basics of what taxonomy is all about and uh, how it fits into our world. So if you go back before the mid-18th century uh, and, and you look at published works such as this, um, you find that they had different ways of referring to organisms, but usually it involved uh, you know, these multi-part names, not really names, they're sort of names slash descriptions, Latin words that sort of described certain characteristics of organisms, and that's how they referred to organisms. And every time they found a new species that was sort of different from one they had before, they just added a few more words in here to make it unique, but these started to get very long, very cumbersome, and very inconsistently incon used among taxonomists. So Around the mid-18th century, this guy reached the prime of his career, Carl Linnaeus. Um, and of particular interest to us taxonomists were two works. One of them was this one, the list of all plant species known to him at the time, published in 1753, Species Plantarum. And then uh, five years later, Systema Naturae, the list of all animal species known to Linnaeus, uh, the 10th edition here, 1758. Now... He did a number of significant things in these works, but the, the main thing he did in these works was, was essentially create a basic structure for how scientific names get assigned to animals, particularly the practice of binomial nomenclature, assigning a species name that had two parts, a genus part and a species part, and that's basically still the system that's in use today. Although in, today in this... Um, um, Oh, I don't know why that's looking that way, but maybe it'll, it'll, it'll show up. Ignore the black words there. Um, <laughs> they'll fill in in a second here. Um, so, so today we need to codify all of this because, well, you know, nerds need to codify things, and we're all nerds. So there are six major codes of, of scientific nomenclature actively used today. One of them is the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature, ICBN. Um, it governs the names of plants and fungi. Fungi are not plants, but through tradition they are covered by this code of nomenclature. Nomenclature. It was first established in 1867 and first formalized in 1930. Uh, it fixes uh, May 1st, 1753 is the official start of plant nomenclature. That's to coincide with the perceived publication date of Species Plantarum. It's governed by the International Botanical Congress, uh, which is, and, and the code itself is managed by the International Association for Plant Taxonomy. Uh, it's updated every six years by the IBC, the International Botanical Congress. Uh, the current version is the version that became in effect in 2006, called the Vienna Code. The next edition coincides with the um, uh, IBC in 2011, which should probably take effect in 2012. 
Now there's the International Code for Zoological Nomenclature, Code of Zoological Nomenclature. It governs the names for animals, first established in 1895. Uh, it fixes 1 January 1758 as the official start. That's the publication date for the 10th edition of Systema Naturae, governed by an actual commission of uh, zoological nomenclature, the ICZN. And one thing people sometimes get confused about is ICZN, or ICZN to us Americans, actually refers to the commission, the C in, in this is commission, whereas up here the C is code. So it's actually um, uh, a slightly different usage of those acronyms, but effectively they're, they're, they're complementary. Um, it's managed by an actual secretariat, which has a budget and employees. It's, it's currently housed at the Natural History Museum in London. It's updated as needed. Currently, we're in its fourth edition, and an early draft of the fifth edition is beginning to come about. Um, the fourth edition took effect in uh, January 1st, 2000. The fifth edition is probably a few years out before it takes effect. And then the uh, bacteria folks have their code, uh, the International Code of Nomenclature of Bacteria, I ICNB. Uh, it governs the names of bacteria, obviously. Um, it was originally a code established in 1947, but that was discarded due to inconsistent usages. And uh, the, the current code was established in 1980, and it fixes a starting point for all bacteriological nomenclature at 1980. And all names for bacteria prior to that are essentially perceived as not existing. Um, all, uh, they're governed by this, uh, this committee, and they um, uh, have a single journal through which all new bacterial names are published. There are three other codes, one of them for viruses, one of them for cultivated plants, and a, a newish one for, um, set up by the International Society of Phylogenetic Nomenclature. You probably know it as Phylocode. We'll probably hear more about that tomorrow afternoon. I'm going to actually talk mostly about these two codes here for the rest of the talk. Not because they're the best codes, they're probably not. Not because they cover most organisms on Earth, they probably don't. Um, but because it, these are the two where most of the Tadwig-related discussions have occurred within the context of. I certainly hope that in the coming years, Tadwig will embrace all of these codes and the, and the solutions will embrace all of them. But for now, it's mostly been about botanical and zoological. So why all the fuss? Why do we need these complex codes of nomenclature and all of that sort of thing. Well, it boils down to better communication. And, and particularly what we're trying to avoid is miscommunication in two forms. One form of miscommunication is when we have multiple names for the same organisms, which we call synonyms. So it's perfectly reasonable that a species that looks like that and a fish that looks like that ought to receive different names because in the, you know, the people who found these things saw really no connection between these two. It wasn't until the invention of scuba where it was discovered that actually this fish over here on the right is a juvenile of the one on the left, so in fact they're the same species. So when you discover that these two names uh, actually refer to the same species, you need rules to decide which of these names to use to refer to it. And so by the uh, code of zoological nomenclature, you would come up with this as the primary name to use for this whole species, and uh, this other name here, Holocanthus bishop, I would be treated as a, as a synonym. Now, the other, the other thing we're trying to avoid in terms of miscommunication is to have the same name for multiple organisms, which is what we call homonyms. So you can imagine a biologist finding this fish, all bright yellow in the genus Centripigy, saying, what a great name, Centripigy flavissimus, from flavus, flavum meaning yellow. And then another biologist in another part of the world finding this other fish in the same genus, but clearly a different species, I mean, clearly to those of us who study these fish, but also thinking... <laughs> thinking, wow, what a neat yellow fish. I think I'll call it flavissimus. So we have a collision here. We have two different biologists not aware of each other's work choosing the same name by coincidence for two different species. So we need a mechanism in the code to resolve this. We can't ha leave these two as legitimate names because then we won't know which one we're referring to. So there has to be a mechanism for coming, deciding which of these keeps flavissimus, which of them gets replaced by a new name, how that new name is replaced, and so on. So this is why all these codes are in existence, really to just try to formalize the process to allow one name for one species, um, one species worldview anyway. So this is, a, uh, this, is a, this is an expression that taxonomists always like to put on their talks about, about um, taxonomy. It's not the right question, though. I mean, I know it's fun to quote Shakespeare and all, but the real question is, is this one. Not what's in a name, but what is a name. And that's the problem we Tadwiggers have had trouble with for a number of years. Because if you look at this list right here, and you think of a name as a text string of characters, where well, you're going to see 13 names there. 
And so if you think of it from the perspective of name bank, UBIO, and several other initiatives, well, we're just dealing with 13 different names. It's a no-brainer. But actually, to a botanist, there are only nine names here. And the reason there are only nine names here is from the code perspective of botany, this pair of names here is the same as this pair of names here because this subgenus designation is just sort of a classification note. It doesn't actually mean it's a different name. And the same thing happens with this pair up here. Then you go to a zoologist, not all zoologists, but a lot of zoologists will see four names in that whole list. Two of them are at the genus level, two of them at the species level, and these are just simply different combinations of those four names. Now, before anyone gets all hot and bothered about this, zoologists actually do strictly enforce binomial nomenclature. It's just that when they see a binomial, uh, you know, they see two names here. They see a genus name and a species epithet name. So the word name is sort of should be verboten among our conversations in Tadwig because when one person says the word name, they have something in their mind, and who everyone else listening has a completely different idea of what they mean by name. So you kind of need to qualify what you mean by name if we're having conversations in Tadwig about this stuff. All right, so authorship. Authorship is very important in taxonomy. Um, uh, I'll go over this fairly quickly. In zoology, we, we recognize the author and the year of the original description of these different species. Um, and then if those species are placed in different genera, by convention, we put them in, in uh, parentheses. Uh, to a botanist, a um, couple of things are different. One, they have these standard abbreviation codes for author names, which, which they pretty much w converge on. So they use those, these abbreviations, and they generally don't put the years on them, although Paul Kirk is starting to do that for fungi names. And another thing that's a little more fundamentally different is that when a botanist assigns a species epithet to a new genus, they keep track of the author who made that new combination. So their authorship actually includes more information than the zoologists do. So, so they'll keep track of the author who made the combination as well as the original author. Another just, I'm going to go over this one really quickly. This is just a quirky thing, but uh, rarely, but occasionally used in taxonomy, you'll have this designator X. And what this really means is that Randall, 1979, published this name Ventralis, but he based it on the intellectual work of Thompson. It's, botanists have the same notion, except conveniently, they reverse the order of the authors <laughs> around the X. So this means exactly the same thing. Randall established the name through the work of Thompson, but it's just one more of those little things that really annoys people who are trying to write parsing algorithms. All right, um, infraspecific ranks are handled slightly differently between the two codes. Uh, in zoology, all trinomials, at least today, are you know the valid ones, the legitimate ones, are considered uh, subspecies. So because they're all subspecies, we don't need any little flag to tell us they're subspecies. If you see a trinomial, you know it's a subspecies. It retains the same authorship as the original combination did. So here's Lubbock, 1985. He named a new species. Somebody else later bumped it down to subspecies. Uh, the authorship designator generally doesn't change. Um, in botany world, it's a little bit different. They add this little abbreviation here that's not italicized to let us know it's a subspecies. And the reason they do that is because they also have other designators like variety. Um, we have to know which one it is, whether it's a subspecies or a variety. Um, and then they also daisy chain them together. They can have quadrinomials and quintinomials, although generally they don't do that in practice anymore. Um, more fundamentally, though, is a little bit of a difference in the way we treat codes. This is perfectly acceptable in botany, that you have an epithet called typus, one of them in the species ventralis, one of them in the species hawaiensis. They're different typuses, typus. They have different original authors, uh, but they're both within the same genus. That's perfectly acceptable in botany. That's not acceptable in uh, zoology. All terminal epithets have to be unique within a genus level for zoology. So that's just one of the sort of quirky differences between the two approaches. Um, quick, quick notion of the concept of a basionym. Basionym is um, basically it's the relationship between a new combination and its original combination. So this Pseudanthius ventralis, the ventralis part, this ventralis randall part is the same as this ventralis randall part. So a basionym is really just a pointer back to the original combination of a name. Now we don't use this word basionym in zoology, but it does exist as a concept. Um, so, so, you know, the same concept exists. We just don't use it. And the main reason we don't use it is we don't have all this stuff about keeping track of who's doing the new combination. So we didn't really need a word for it. All right. More confusing differences between the two. The word available in zoology, a name is available. That means the code says this name was, was created properly and can be used. 
um, is, is the word that the botanists use is validly published. Now, that's unfortunately because the word valid used by a zoologist means like a subjectively valid, like I consider these things to be two species because I'm a splitter, or I consider them to be the same species because I'm a lumper. Valid is, is, has to do with that subjective stuff, uh, whereas a botanist would use the term correct name or something similar to that. Uh, uh, five minutes? Okay, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, Junior synonyms and senior synonyms are terms that zoologists use. Homotypic synonyms and heterotypic synonyms are terms that uh, botanists use. All right, now I'm going to go into the whole complicated, convoluted world of names versus concepts. And in order to do that, we have to divide things into the real world and the world of taxonomy, which are decidedly different worlds. Um, in the real world, we have fish. They live on coral reefs. Naturalists go out and they catch these fish and they kill them and they put them in jars of alcohol and they end up in museums. Taxonomists come along and look at these, these jars of fish and decide, Eureka, I found a new species. And the process by naming a new species is you select one particular specimen, you designate it the holotype of your new species name, a new species name is created. That name is linked to this holotype, which is one specimen, one singular specimen, not all of this other stuff. But clearly, when Snyder created this name, he intended it to refer to this entire thing. So all of these organisms that fall within this yellow ring here is the concept Snyder had in mind. Uh, it's called a circumscription. You'll see that word a lot. So um, uh, here's the name, Snyder's name, and also Snyder's concept. And the convention is to use this, this little term, sec. This means this name of Snyder in the concept of Snyder. So it's his own concept of the name. Now, also in the real world, we have in another part of the real world, we have these other um, um, organisms living out there. Um, and same thing, some of them get killed, put in jars by museums, taxonomists come and look at them, and you say, well, ha, I have a new species, I designate a holotype, now I've got this new species name, and this guy Norman had also a species concept to go along with that name, which is the circumscription of all these things that Norman would have placed under that name umbrella, and we have the same convention of, of concepts. So here's where it starts to get interesting. Say Jordan comes along and says, you know, this thing's so different, I'm going to create a new genus name for it. So he creates a new genus name for it, um, designates this as the type species of the, of the genus, which is analogous to the type specimen of a species. And now we've renamed it. We've, we've now got a new, new combination there. And, um, and, but the concept hasn't changed. Jordan's concept of the species is identical. It's got the same circumscription of organisms. It's just that it's changed names. So new name, same concept. Um, then over here, we have, uh, just, just to make things interesting, we've got more organisms, more dead fish in jars, more taxonomists saying, waha, I have a new species here, but I think it belongs in this genus, and I'm going to revise the whole group, and I think, why all of these belong in the same genus? So I've got my concept for my new species, I'm also going and I'm renaming these other new species, even though I'm not changing the concepts, I'm giving them new names. So here we have more, three different concepts of, of a species, and, uh, and the names are changing. And then you have this jerk, Rich Pyle, who's doing his PhD, who goes out scuba diving all over the Pacific and starts to realize there's really no distinction between all of these guys over there and all of these guys over here. So he says, you know what, that's actually a synonym of that. I'm not going to go change the name, but I am going to change the concept. So now, Pyle's concept that takes this name by, by priority, 1904 beats 1933, so this name now applies to this whole circumscription of organisms, so it's a different concept using the same name. So that's sort of the, 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 the problem we have, is, is names don't match perfectly to concepts. Sometimes the same, the same concept it goes by different legitimate names, and sometimes the same name uh, can refer to different legitimate concepts. And then, in, in this case, I left that one alone. Um, I have a few more slides, but they're not very informative slides. I think that pretty much covers the scope of things that, that we in the taxonomy and the nomenclature and the taxon concept world have to deal with. Um, uh, I could go into more detail, but I think we're kind of short on time, so I'll leave it at that for now. But by all means, I'd be happy to address any questions. Thank you.